Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me. C4 models as code. Architecture diagrams. We've all been there. We've all done it. Historically and traditionally, they are terrible. I'm imagining a bunch of you have whiteboards that look like this back in your offices. Don't tell me if you do. That's not the place to discuss this. Um, this is not a tooling issue either. So I've been running architecture diagramming workshops all around the world for the past uh, 10, 15 years. And during those architecture diagramming workshops, we use pen and paper, whiteboards, whatever. And people have always asked me, well, if you let people use a tool during your workshops, do you think you get better diagrams? And the answer is no. And I know this for a fact now because during the pandemic, I did some online workshops. And instead of using pen and paper and whiteboards, we were using Miro and Mural uh, and tools like that. So this isn't a tooling thing. UML has massively gone out of fashion. I've heard tons and tons of reasons why people don't want to use UML these days. Uh, a lot of people think it's not expected in Agile, in our quotes. Not really sure where that comes from, uh, but it's very common, very prevalent. Uh, the tooling has historically been horrendous. Uh, anyone use Rational Rose in the past? Yeah, yellow boxes, weird pink, purple borders. Who thought that looked pretty? Uh, there's something about UML that kind of drags you into lots and lots of detail. I had a company say to my face, if you use UML here, you'll be seen as old and old fashioned, which was quite funny. So lots of people don't want to use UML. There's a lack of appetite for it anymore, essentially. So that's where C4 comes into play. Uh, C4 model is something I created around about 2006, 2008, something like that. I'm not entirely sure when it kind of um, was created, to be honest with you. You can find more information about C4 model at c4model.com. The principle that underlies C4 model is this. If you don't want to use UML, but you do need to create some architecture diagrams, try to do so in a structured way. So make sure your boxes and arrows have some degree of structure and make sure your notation is self-describing. That's essentially C4 in a nutshell. Who's using C4 here, by the way? That's a good chunk of hands. Awesome. Hopefully you find it useful as well. I'm going to do a quick intro to C4 for those of you who might not be familiar with it because the tooling I'm going to show you kind of requires this as some prerequisite knowledge. So C4 is essentially two things. Thing number one is a set of hierarchical abstractions, and there are four of them. The highest level of abstraction is what I call a software system. This is the hardest of these abstractions to define clearly and cleanly. But essentially, a software system is typically something that we as a single team are responsible for producing. So it's something that we as a team can see the implementation details of. Maybe there's a life cycle thing. So everything we produce as a team is, is lockstep deployed at the same time. Typically, there's an ownership boundary around something we're delivering. If we look inside these things I call software systems, I'm going to say they are made up of one or more containers. Now, I'm not talking about Docker. There's an unfortunate clash of naming here. You've heard the story. I got the name first. That's irrelevant now. By container, I basically mean an application or a data store. So the things we build as a team, they are made up of applications and data stores. So your single page apps, Angular or React running in a web browser, your server-side apps like Spring Boot, Spring MVC, Ruby on Rails, C Sharp, ASP.NET, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I mean by app application. And from a data perspective, it's something like a database schema on MySQL or Oracle. It could be a collection of documents in a graph database or document database. It could be a bucket on Amazon S3 or it could be a folder on a file share. So the things we make as teams are made up of applications and data stores. Collectively, I call these things containers. If we look inside the containers, specifically the code-focused containers, the application containers, they are essentially made up of components. Now, components is a massively overused, ambiguous, vague word. I get that. But I want to use the word component here to mean this. A grouping of related functionality, hopefully a nice, clean, well-defined interface is the way into that functionality, running inside a container. So in this set of abstractions, in this approach, Components are not individually, separately deployable things. It's the container, it's the application that's the runnable thing. So if you're building a Spring Boot application, your components might be an interface with a bunch of implementation classes behind it, which leads me on to level four. Level four is code. So if we look inside these components we're building, they're just made up of code level elements. 
in, in Java and, and C Sharp and C++, it's interfaces, classes, enums. In JavaScript, it's objects and functions. In F Sharp or Haskell or functional languages, it's functions. So that bottom level represents the code level constructs we have in the languages that we're using to build our components. And that's it, that's the set of abstractions. Software systems made up of containers. Containers contain components, that's where the naming comes from, and components are built from code. So that's the abstractions. Once you have the abstractions, you can now create a set of hierarchical diagrams that basically map onto those abstractions. And C4 is named after this set of, this set of hierarchical diagrams, not the abstractions. So it's context, containers, components, and code four levels of diagrams that map onto the four levels of abstractions. And what we're doing here is we're drawing a high-level diagram, and then we're taking a box and we're zooming in to show the internals of that box. And then we're taking another box and we're zooming down further to show the internals of that box. So again, it's, it's nested, it's hierarchical. The concept here is maps. So I live in Jersey in the Channel Islands, and if you open up Google Maps and you do a search for Jersey, you're probably going to get that picture. That's great if you want to know where the airport is and where the major roads are, but if you've never heard of Jersey, it's too much detail too quickly. This is like turning up to your project on day one on Monday and somebody says, hey, just add this feature, here's half a million lines of code. Like, oh, okay, thanks. Can we step back a bit? How do we fix that problem with Google Maps? Well, stepping back is easy, you pinch to zoom out. On the flip side, you can zoom in. And if you zoom in far enough, you get down to Google Street View which is a one-to-one -one mapping with the real world when the photos were taken. I want to do the same thing with software architecture diagrams. I want different levels of diagrams that allow me to tell different stories to different audiences. The top level diagrams are relatively non-technical, and as you progress down into the hierarchy, it's much more technical detail. So it's much more developer focused the further you go down the hierarchy. And that's just a natural um, way of working for um, many of us as software developers. I'm going to introduce the top two level diagrams in a little bit more detail. The, the top level diagram is a context, or rather a system context diagram. And the system context diagram basically sh says, here's the system we are building, or documenting, or describing, or designing, and here is the world around it in terms of people and other software systems. So in other words, the other way to think about this is if you want to draw a system context diagram for something you are building, you have to answer these types of questions. So what's the scope of the thing we're building? So what features sit inside our boundary and what features sit outside of our boundary in other systems in the environment, in our landscape of systems? Who is using our system? So who are the users, the roles, the actors, the personas, the real named people who are using the thing that we are building? How are they getting value from our system? And what are our system integration points? So how does the thing we are building talk to something else that other team is building inside or outside of our environment. Answer those questions and you can draft up a system context diagram. This is an example diagram from one of my workshops. The red box represents the, the system that this group uh, was designing. It's a little case study around a, a financial risk system. They've correctly identified the two types of users. There's a business user and a, a kind of advanced business user that can do some configuration of parameters and the black boxes represent the system integration points in their environment. So it's a nice high-level diagram. It's very light on technology choices. It's a great diagram you can use to start all conversations to pretty much all audiences. But as developers, we want more information. So what we want to do now, of course, is take that red box, pitch the zoom in, and drop down to level two. Level two is a container diagram, and it's showing us the applications and data stores that make up our systems. So now it's a different set of questions. So what are those major technology building blocks? What are the applications and data stores that need to be running for our system to work? What are the responsibilities of those things? Are they processing business logic? Are they storing data? That sort of thing. And how do they communicate? Answer those questions and you can drop down and draw a container diagram. So this is the container diagram from that same solution, from the same group. The red box is now bigger because we've zoomed into the contents of that red box, and now we are showing things like um, React apps running on a front end, and there's a Java Spring there, and a bunch of data stores and some Java command line apps. So those are the applications and data stores, the C4 containers, that sit inside that particular solution. A few more tech choices now, integration protocols, 
So we've lost all of our non-technical people, but now this is great for uh, us as developers, architects, ops staff, DevOps, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So that's C4 in a nutshell. It's notation independent. That's one of the big things I want to say here because there is a misconception that C4 equals blue and gray boxes. And that's my fault because all of the example diagrams I show are blue and gray boxes. But a lot of people have, have written blog posts on this and they've said the C4 notation is boring because it's blue and gray boxes. So if you go to c4model.com now and you click refresh a bunch of times, you'll get different colored versions of the examples. <laughs> and I did that because I was utterly fed up of this whole blue gray box thing. You don't have to use fancy shapes and colors. You could use UML if you wanted to. So UML has its own set of boxes and lines and semantics and notations. There's nothing stopping you taking C4 abstractions and diagram types and applying them to UML. I don't see people doing this, but you could do if you want to. So tooling. If you go to c4model.com, there's a tooling link. I've tried to assemble on the c4model.com website a list of all of the tooling that provides some degree of specific support for the C4 model. There are different types of tools here. Some are diagramming tools, some are modeling tools, so let's get into that. Most teams typically use Visio, Lucidchart, Diagrams.net, Draw.io. Who's using these tools? Yeah, that's going to be a big chunky, right? These tools are very common, they're very popular, they're easy to get hold of, the barrier to entry is very, very low. Most teams have uh, free access to these sorts of tools. I don't recommend them if you're using C4 model for drawing architecture diagrams for a bunch of reasons. I'm going to justify this. So reason number one, these tools don't know what you are doing. These tools just see shapes and arrows. They can't help you. They don't know the few rules of C4 and they can't guide you in the right direction. So for example, one of the rules in C4 is if you're drawing a system context diagram, the only two elements you really should have on that diagram are people and software systems. That's it. If you draw a system context diagram in a tool like Visio, there's nothing stopping you putting a little logging component on there. Right? Please don't do that, but Visio can't help there. If you want to draw two diagrams in a tool like Visio, you need to open two tabs, two worksheets, two diagram canvases. And one of the things you might notice with C4 is you have to copy elements across different diagrams. So I'll have a bunch of people on my context diagram and the same bunch of people on my, on my container diagram. In a tool like Visio, you have to now copy and paste those people across both diagrams. If you rename one of those people, you'll probably forget to do it on all of the diagrams where that person exists. So again, the tool can't help enforce consistency. That's entirely on your shoulders. This goes without saying, if you've ever tried to dump these files out into a text format to stick them into Git, you'll know they're an absolute nightmare. And they do mix content and presentation. If you change the color of a box, for example, you get an entirely different file, which of course makes it hard to diff, which makes it hard to put these things into pull requests, et cetera, et cetera. And these tools are really hard to automate. These tools are typically grab the mouse, click here, click here, drag here. They're very interactive from a user perspective. Imagine you have an AWS environment and you want to point Visio at that AWS environment and scrape some data out and magically create a deployment architecture diagram. That's really hard to do with a tool like Visio. You can do it with things like draw.io, uh, diagrams.net. You can create a CSV file and push a CSV file and magic happens. But there's quite a few opportunities that you're missing there if you're using these types of tools. They can't easily be plugged into CI, CD build processes. And they're a pain in the ass. Right, that's the biggest problem with these tools. They're a pain in the ass. Because you draw a diagram, and you try and make that arrow straight, and it's not straight. It's one pixel out. <laughs> and you'll spend 10 minutes trying to fix it by moving the entire diagram around. And then you'll realize the text in that, in that person is a bit too wide, and you want to change it. How do you change it? Do you change the font size in just that one element? No, because then you want the font size to match everywhere. And it just, it's just a rabbit hole. So diagrams as code. Uh, in, I think it was October 2020, diagrams as code as a concept blipped on the uh, ThoughtWorks Tech Radar. 
Diagrams as code is essentially, instead of using a UI to create a diagram, you write some degree of code or text and some tooling generates your diagram automatically. The most common ones are plant UML, who's using plant UML? Yeah, big chunk of you. And mermaids, who's using mermaid? It's funny, isn't it? Mermaids, mermaids just, you can, there's native support in things like GitHub pages for mermaid now, but plant UML is still the tool I see people using the most. But maybe that'll change in the future. So diagrams as code is great because it's easy to author, so we can type some text and get a diagram. We don't have to worry about things like layout. Uh, so most of these tools are automatic layout. They're, they're text, these files are text, uh, so we can stick them in version control. They're easy to diff. And many of these tools are command line driven, so we can now easily integrate them in our CI CD pipelines. So for example, you could write some code to scrape your AWS environment, generate a plant UML definition, check that in, have it rendered on your build. C4 plant UML is probably the one a lot of people will find first. It's a set of extensions or macros for the plant UML tooling. And it really gives you a C4 style domain specific language that you can use to craft up your diagrams. So you talk about person and system and relationship. So that's a nice starting point. Plant UML and Mermaid and most of the other diagrams as code tools are still diagramming tools like Visio. What I mean by this is if you want to create two diagrams, like a context diagram and a container diagram, you have to create two text files. If you rename an element that appears in both those text files, you have to make sure you rename it twice in, in each text file. Now, as developers, we have fantastic tools. We can use global search and replace. Uh, Plant UML will allow you to include common elements, but this doesn't work as well as it should do a lot of the time. So again, if you want consistency, that's on your shoulders. I want to shift the narrative away from diagramming and back to, he says nervously, back to modeling. Now modeling is something we used to do in the late 1990s, early 2000s, tools like Rational Rose, Rational Software Architect. We used to spend like months and months plowing all this data into these big, heavyweight, expensive, ugly looking modeling tools to generate some diagrams, which would then be out of date by the time we went to write some code. So it's no wonder the, that these big, expensive, bloated modeling tools fell out of fashion, especially when the whole agile thing came around, of course. But the concept of having a model is super, super powerful. Think about a model as being nothing more than a dictionary. You have a single dictionary definition of all of your people and software systems and containers and components and links between them. And then if you want a bunch of different diagrams, these are just views onto parts of that model. You want to rename something, you rename your single definition and all your diagrams magically change. They're kept up to date and kept consistent. That's the power of having a model. So during the pandemic, so as I said, I usually fly around the world and do architecture diagramming workshops. It turns out that's incompatible when there's a pandemic. So I did a few things online, but um, mostly I just kind of went surfing and stuff. I also created this thing called the Structurizer DSL, which is a text-based um, kind of diagrams as code tool that's specifically focused on building architecture diagrams for the C4 model. With Plant UML, you want two diagrams, you create two text files. With this tooling, you create a single model and the tooling generates you multiple diagrams, multiple views of that single model. So it's really a kind of text-based modeling tool, a lightweight modeling tool that you can use to create architecture diagrams. As I said, lots of people start with Plant UML, C4 Plant UML, and that works really well if you've got a couple of small diagrams, but once you start getting bigger systems or you want to start modeling, uh, landscapes of systems, you want to start reusing elements across multiple systems, uh, it does start to get quite complicated. So that's a kind of word of caution if you are starting out afresh, have a look at plant UML, but, but maybe keep it in your back pocket for later and I'll come back to that statement in a second. So really this is models as code or more accurately C4 models as code. And there's one concept we're going to be showing in the demos here and that concept is a workspace. And a workspace is really nothing more than a wrapper for three things. A model, a set of views, and some supplementary documentation. 
So the model is your definition of people, software systems, containers, components, relationships, and things like deployment nodes and infrastructure nodes. So this tooling also does support the uh, dynamic and deployment diagrams that are described on c4model.com, but I'm not going to show that today. There's a set of views, and again, all of the standard C4 views are um, supported, and you can have Markdown and ASCII doc documentation, architecture decision records, and a bunch of other stuff that I'm also not going to talk about today. This tooling is kind of interesting because the workspace is stored in a JSON document. There's an Open API 3 Swagger style um, works, uh, JSON definition. You can create that JSON document using a whole manner of different toolings. I'm going to show you the Structurized DSL, but there's also some other tooling that you can find on GitHub that will allow you to author these things and create a JSON document, which is compatible with all of the rendering tools. So one of the nice things about the Structurizer tooling is that it's rendering tool agnostic. So I'm going to show you first my own rendering tool, uh, which is the same one that, you, uh, that I use for the example diagrams. But it's also possible to create a bunch of plant UML diagrams from a single Structurizer model, a single Structurizer definition, which I think is, is quite a, a powerful use case. So let's ditch the slides. And let me show you my desktop, which, believe it or not, is empty. Yes. So the, the tool I'm going to use here is called Structurizer Lite. Structurizer Lite is it's written in Java. It's a Spring Boot app. It's all, on, it's all open source. It's all on GitHub. I'm running the Docker version. So there's two builds I, I, um, I, I create here. There's a, a Docker image, and there's a, a kind of Spring Boot war file. So I'm using the Docker image because it's a little bit easier. All I'm basically doing here is I'm spinning up the Docker image, doing a standard port map, and I'm going to mount a volume on my desktop, uh, a folder on my desktop, into uh, a volume on the Docker image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up Lite against a folder that doesn't yet exist on my desktop called DevOx. So Structurizer Lite is going to boot up. We go back here, now that folder's created, and this thing called a workspace.dsl file has been created. So this is the Structurized DSL. Here's our workspace. It consists of a model and a set of views in this case. So let me just briefly explain what this means. In this example, so this is just a template that's created for you, we are defining a person with the name user, and we're assigning out to a variable called user. We are defining a software system with the name software system, Please come up with better names yourself. And uh, we're defining a relationship between the user and the software system with a description of users. Again, please use better descriptions. So that's my model. It's a person, a system, and a relationship. And we are defining a single system context view here. The scope is that software system. Uh, this is just a diagram identifier. And we're saying include star. What include star here does is it says include the software system in scope, which is this thing and include automatically anything connected to it. So because we're building up a model here, we can just traverse the model. It's a force directed graph and include or exclude elements as we need to. So that's an example DSL file. If I go to Chrome and I go to Locos 8080, the Structurizer Lite interface will boot up. And here's my diagram. So I created this tooling with manual layout in mind. I don't like automatic layout. It always puts boxes in the wrong place or the lines overlap. I, I want I, When I'm drawing an architecture diagram, I want to tell a story. I want my users here and my outputs over here, and I, I, and I want consistency when, when I'm creating multiple diagrams. So for example, I always want my people in the top left across all my diagrams, for example. So this tooling is really built with manual layout in mind. And you can do things like add vertexes, vertices to the lines, and you can change the routing of lines and, and move boxes around and all that good stuff. Now, what I can do is I can go to my DSL file and I can change the name of this element to Simon, go back, refresh, and now it's updated. And some of you might be thinking, well, where's the layout? Like I've got some XY coordinates sitting beneath this box somewhere, and it just came back. So what happens is there's a, a merging algorithm built into the Structurizer Lite tooling that tries to figure out what you just changed based upon a, a whole bunch of different things. The layout information is actually stored in the JSON version of that uh, workspace, which if I open up, it's just a big JSON file. Surprise, surprise. Um, here is our person called Simon bunch of information. Here's our software system. 
This is the definition of our context view, and here we can see all the x, y coordinates. So what you do is you, you take that folder that's just been created, you check it into Git, and now anybody on the team can fire up that same exact architecture diagram. So I'm a big fan of manual layout, and there's a whole bunch of tools in the UI that help you line the boxes up. For the purposes of this demo, I'm going to turn on automatic layout, uh, just because it makes it easier. So there is support for automatic layout. It kind of works OK. You'll see all the toolbar buttons have, have disappeared now. Um, but this is not my recommended approach for using this tooling. So let's change the name of this to business user. And we'll change this to be financial risk system. And let's do FRS BU. This makes it a bit more realistic. BU has a link to FRS. FRS, hopefully that should work. So rinse, repeat, you can now add more people, more systems, et cetera, et cetera. So imagine we've done our context diagram, defining the thing we're building and the people who are using it. When it comes to adding containers or drawing a container diagram, what we can do now is we can open up a set of curly braces. The curly brace needs to be on the same line. I'm sorry if you don't like that, but that's the, that's the way it is. Uh, and now we can start adding containers inside this software system definition. So we can say web app equals container web app. Let's call it web application. Again, please come up with better names. And let's have a database, which is going to be a container. And we're going to say database schema. And let's say that the business user has a link to the web app users. And the web app has a link to the database reads from and env writes to. So if I save this and refresh, what's going to happen? Nothing. So the reason nothing happens is because I've added a bunch of things to my model, but I don't have a view that allows me to see those things. So what I want to do is I want to create a container view. How do I do that? The easiest way to do this is to copy this block, paste it in, change this to container. So we want to create a container view. The scope is still the, the FRS, the financial risk system. And we'll need to change the identifier. Include start is going to do something different this time. Include start is going to include all the containers inside this software system and include things that live outside that have a link to those containers. So if I go back and now refresh my diagram, you'll notice there's a little magnifying glass thing here. So I can double click, and I can drop down to my container diagram. So this shows our business user using our web application and the uh, web application talking to the database. Now, don't repeat yourself is a mantra we always talk about when we're doing software development, and I've just broken it here. I've essentially copied and repeated that relationship, albeit at two different levels of abstraction. And I don't like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete one of them. Now, you have to delete the right one. I'm going to delete the top level one. So I'm going to define the link between the user and the web app and the web app and the database. If I save this, go back here, refresh. So these two arrows are the two arrows in this text file. Those are the ones we've explicitly defined. If I go back to my context diagram, this arrow is still here. So this is a feature I created called implied relationships. Because there is a relationship between the user and the web application, which is a container of the software system, there is an implied link between the user and the software system itself. And you can customize this and, and turn it off and, and do whatever you want to. It's basically just a bunch of Java code running under the scenes, and you can plug in different strategies if you want to. But yeah, it's a really nice, powerful feature that reduces the number of relationships that you have to define manually when you're creating your architecture diagrams. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Something I never show in my demos is, is include with different things. So in, in, in all of the conference talks and demos and, and tutorials I've done, I've just left this as include star, and it always raises lots of questions. So include star, as I said, it, it varies on, on the context of the, of the view type that you're defining here. I can change this to say include the BU, the web app, and the database. And that will still work. So you can include things individually if you want to. We could also do include um, on separate lines. So that's also going to work. 
We can also in do something like element dot type equals container. So there's a little expression language built into the DSL, which allows you to do a bunch of different things, which is going to give us the same result. We can also do things like elements dot parent equals frs. That's going to give us the same result. And this is the one I like the most. So we'll include web app, which gives us that box. If we add an arrow before and an arrow afterwards, we get all our boxes back. So this is the power of having a little expression language on top of that model. It's a force directed graph, so we can just basically go traverse the model. So what this says is include things coming into web app of the appropriate type for the, for the diagram you have, and include things coming out of the web app. So the afferent and the efferent couplings, if you want to use that terminology. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of cool expressions that you can use to slice and dice your models. Not particularly useful here, but I'll come back to this feature later on because it's a great way to uh, partition and create diagrams for much more larger and complicated software systems. So that's my context and container diagram. And there's a bunch of stuff you can do through this UI. You can export it to PNG files and SVG files and a whole bunch of other stuff. You can just fire it up and have a play if you want to. Gray boxes. Right, we need to fix gray boxes. I, I, I know I said that C4 is notation independent, but this has no notation currently. It's just gray boxes, so let's, let's try and fix that. Let's add some color as a starting point. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a styles block. Now, what goes in the styles block? If I enable this little button here, tooltips, and hover the mouse over, you'll see a little tooltip, and it says element and person. So these are text-based tags associated with that element. The financial risk system element has an element tag and a software system tag. Whenever you have done front-end development, HTML and CSS, you have a HTML element and a bunch of CSS classes. It's exactly the same concept. So all we need to do now is essentially create an element style for a specific tag, and the style will be reflected where that tag is present in the model. So we can say create an element style for the element tag, so we can, we can um, target everything. And we can say background green color white. Whoa. So now we've got white on green. We can change the shape as well. So we can say shape rounded box. Give it some web 2.0 rounded corners. <laughs> and that's that's applied to all, all of our elements here. Let's change the uh, shape of the person to a person shape. Uh, it's just the same deal. We're going to create an element style for the person tag. And the shape is going to be person. So that's our person. Go down to our container diagram. This kind of looks OK, but it'd be really nice if we had a, like a database shape. How do we do a database shape? Uh, Tooltips, element and person tags, element and container tags, element and container tags. So I can't target container because that's going to hit web app and database. I need to add a new tag uh, so I can target the style accordingly. So how do I do that? Go back up here, tags, database, that should work. Go back, save, refresh, tooltips, element, container, database tags. So now we can create an element style for the database tag. And the shape is going to be, any ideas? Cylinder. Who said database? No, cylinder. So there's our, our cylinder shape. And if we want to make that a different color, we absolutely can do. So one of the things I said is C4 is notation dependent, as demonstrated. I also said make sure you use a self-describing notation. Now, I've used a blue cylinder to represent a database, but that might not be obvious to some of you. This tooling generates you a diagram key automatically based upon the tags in the model and the styles that you create. So this is a really nice way to have that all taken care of. If you're using tools like Visio, you have to make sure your diagram key, provided you create one, of course, uh, matches your diagrams, what they actually look like. And there's a bunch of stuff you can do here. You can add icons and change border styles. And there's, yeah, there's lots of stuff you can do here if you want to. So that's the kind of basics of the Structurizer DSL, uh, different views. I've showed you some of the expression syntax 
and, and how to do some of that styling. What I want to do now is I wanted to show you that this is all rendering tool independent. So this is the Structurizer Light renderer. Also on GitHub is a bunch of tooling called the Structurizer CLI. It's a little command line interface. It's basically a little Java app, and it embeds all, uh, all of the, uh, the libraries that are built, again, which are all open source, all on GitHub. And you can use the Structurizer CLI to export views defined in a workspace to different formats. So I've got the CLI already installed. We can say Structurizer export. The workspace is going to be that same example we just showed you. So we point it to the, um, the workspace.dsl file. And the format is going to be format plant UML. So what this does now is it creates you a bunch of plant UML files, which you can basically just drop into plant UML as before, and you get your diagrams. Now, rather than me copying this out onto my clipboard, going into plant UML and firing it all up, I'm going to show you the Structurizer demo page, which is structurizer.com slash DSL. Going to take my workspace we were just creating. I'm going to copy it in. Fingers crossed we get the same diagram. So this is the same diagram we just had in the local Structurizer light tooling. Going to hide that. So here's our plant UML export. So the export utilities, it's just another Java library. It's also on GitHub, it's all open source. This demo page basically embeds the same function, functionality as the CLI. So here's our plant UML um, uh, definition for that system context diagram. So no, that's the system context diagram there. So there's a the diagram, there's a key. So we all notice is the different rendering tools, different rendering engines give you a different set of shapes. So I've tried to make the exports as close to the Structurizer versions as possible, but that's not the case um, across all of the different rendering engines. So that's the context diagram, and this is the container diagram, which should, should have the blue database, and there's the diagram key. So this is a very nice way to create all your plant UML files from a single model. So you can still use your plant UML tooling, but you're, you're just not writing the plant UML files by hand. So that's the difference here. There is an export to C4 plant UML that's also supported. So this will generate you a shorter, more succinct uh, plant UML definition based on the C4 plant UML macros. For those of you who are Mermaid fans, there is also a Mermaid export. So here is the system context diagram, and here is the container diagram. There's an export to dot, so if you're a fan of kind of raw dot and graphics tools, there's a, an export for that. And if you have dynamic diagrams, so um, like thing A calls thing B, calls thing C, sends uh, responses back, you can export those to sequence diagrams for use uh, for rendering with web sequence diagrams if you want to. So that's uh, another really nice feature. It's rendering tool independent. If you have your own tool you want to build, absolutely just slurp in the model and then you can render it however you want to, which is kind of quite nice. Um, what else do I want to show you? Probably just a couple more things. One of the big questions I get with this tooling is, well, how does it work when you get bigger, more complicated models? Can you do things like include? Uh, yes, you absolutely can do. So what we can do, if we go back to our, our DevOps example, we can take this whole thing out, uh, open up a new file, we'll save that as model.dsl and we can go back and we can just do include model.dsl so that will hopefully still give us the same result so there's support for includes here and all include does is it kind of inlines the file that you point it at you can also point it at a folder one of the things to bear in mind with the structurized dsl is that ordering is important the reason it's important is because it affects how and, and when and whether those implied relationships are defined. So with that in mind, if you point the, the exclamation mark include statement to a folder of DSL files, you need to make sure they are in the right order from a kind of file name alphabetical perspective. Just a little gotcha that kind of catches people out. If you want to do kind of enterprise-wide modeling, um, what you can do is let's create another file so we can say workspace model. Let's create a software system called A. 
So imagine we have a, a landscape of systems in our environment. We can create a DSL file that basically defines all the systems in our environment. So who's using Backstage, Spotify Backstage, or a service catalog? It's the same kind of concept. You want to go and register all of your systems in a central place. And then what we can do with our workspace is we can say um, we extend landscape and we can do things like, what have I done? I've just wrecked my demo. <laughs> That's fine. What we can do is we can say model and we can do exclamation mark ref A. So basically go and find software system A that's defined in the landscape. And now we can add our web application. So this is really nice because now you can have a central definition of all of your software systems and then have each team produce their own DSL file that, that documents the internals of that software system, containers, components, relationships, and then they can own that, but you still have your central definition. There are some interesting decisions that you need to make here when you take this approach. And one of those decisions is where do you put the relationships? So in your landscape, do you just define software systems or do you also define all of the potential people and roles and actors and personas that use all of the software systems in your landscape? If you want to do that, where do you define the relationships between them? It's really do you want a centralized model of your architecture or a decentralized model? My preference is to go for a decentralized model. So your landscape file just defines systems and then every team defines people and relationships to those systems. The question then becomes, well, how do I generate myself a nice big single landscape diagram that has all of the links between people and between systems? And the answer is you write yourself a DSL plugin, for example, that goes and loads all of the child workspaces and figures out what the relationships are and kind of creates a landscape um, model of all of your actual data. So there's a, there's a bunch of uh, kind of advanced stuff that you can get into there if you want to. So let me shut this Docker container down. And I want to show you another little example. So this is really how, how do we deal with like bigger systems where we've got more things, more boxes, etc. So I have like a, um, a services style example. So let's go structure as a light. So imagine we have some sort of a service-based architecture. Now, this is a bit of a weird service-based architecture. Imagine we have one software system, that's the little grain line, you probably can't see that on the screen. And inside that one software system is a bunch of services, microservices if, if you want to use that term. I'm saying here that every service is comprised of an API thing and a database thing. And in this particular example, our software system is made up of eight services and there are some links between each of those eight services. And this is what my all containers diagram looks like. It's showing me all of the API applications and all of the data stores associated with all of the services inside our software system boundary. Now this doesn't look too bad. We only have eight services here, but imagine we started adding service nine, service 10, service 11, service 20, service 50. This diagram would start to get complicated quite quickly. So the question then becomes, well, how do we deal with a growing, um, a growing software system in terms of scale and complexity? So this diagram is showing you one diagram with eight services. What you could do instead is you could draw one diagram per service. So here is a container diagram just focused on service one, things coming into service one and things coming out of service one. Here is a service two version, same deal. Here is a service three version, you get the picture. So the question becomes, how do you do that? And of course, with a tool like Visio, it's, it's impossible. You basically have to start copy and pasting elements and, and arrows across all of your different uh, diagram canvases. With this particular example, which is the services example here. It, let me show you the workspace DSL file. So there's a feature here uh, that allows you to scope your variables used to identify elements uh, as hierarchical. Oh, I'll explain that in a second. Here is service one. So in this, in this demo, I said that service one is comprised of an API container and a database container. And I'm using a concept in the DSL called a group to say this group of two things equals service one. This is kind of important because when many people use C4, 
they want to define service as an abstraction. And they'll typically do that by saying a service equals a container, and then the API thing and the database schema are components inside that container. But that's not correct according to the C4 definition, because components are not separately deployable things. So that leads to this situation where the API thing and the database schema are the containers, and it's really just the grouping of these two things that is the system. So that's service one. Service two is defined in the same way. Service three is defined in the same way as a service four, et cetera, et cetera. And to create the example, I created a bunch of links between the services. This is the all containers definition. It says, uh, draw me a container view for the software system, include all containers. This is the service one version. So it's including service one. So we're referring to that combination of the API and the data store, things coming into that group and things leaving that group. So this is why the expression language is quite powerful. If you have a large and complicated model of your system, whether it's a, a components in a monolith or a set of services in a distributed architecture or even systems in a landscape, you can use the expression functionality here to slice and dice your model to produce those subsets or partition views. So it's a really nice feature. It's really powerful. You get all the consistency of the, of, of the model-based approach. The downside of this, uh, and again, it's all trade-offs. The downside is, in this view, you get the big picture. You get everything. But as you add more boxes, it gets more complicated to see what's going on. You have more overlapping lines, et cetera, et cetera. This view's simpler, but now you lack context around it. So it's like you have a set of blinkers on it, and you're just focused on a tiny portion of your, of your software model here. So it's all trade-offs. And maybe you have a, a, a set of diagrams of each type. Another approach is to click this little button here. And we get that. How cool is that? So this is a D3JS force directed graph showing you exactly the same information. This is a, a C4 model container view not rendered now as a traditional diagram, but instead rendered as a force directed graph, which is interactive. So we can start clicking on things to see nearest neighbors. There's a quick find feature. So this is a really nice way to, again, explore and navigate a larger data set. So if you have a complicated dis distributed architecture, or you have a complicated uh, portfolio in your landscape, this is another visualization approach that you can use. And again, this is why I said the Structurizer tooling is rendering tool independent. There's one more thing I'm going to show you here. And to do this, I'm going to go back to the DSL demo page because it's easier for me. I'm going to click the microservices link at the bottom. So if you want to see this example, it's linked to on the, on the page. That's the example I showed you before. That's the graph. Again, as I said, this is all rendering tool independent. You can produce the plant UMR versions if you want to. I'm going to go to Illograph, export to the Illograph format. I'm going to go to app.illograph.com. Click new diagram, paste mine in, click static structure. So this is an export to the Illograph tool, which is a really nice uh, UI for exploring and visualizing a hierarchical data set. The C4 model is a hierarchical data set. So actually it turns out this works really well and it's interactive. So now we can start clicking around and trying to find nearest neighbors, relationships and all that sort of thing. And if we go to the demo page again and go to the big bank example, so the big bank example are the diagrams you will see on the C4 website. I go export to Illograph, go back here, copy this in, click static structure. So here is the big bank examples in Illograph where we've now got multiple levels of abstraction. We've got software systems, containers, and components. And now we can start to drill in and zoom in even further on things. So again, you have a bunch of visualization options depending on what you are trying to do here. And that's something that's worth keeping in mind. It's people often tell me that C4 doesn't scale. It's not C4 not being able to scale. It's the rendering tool that you're using to tell the story that you want to tell. So I have one minute left and a couple of slides, which is just perfect. So I've given you a quick demo of the Structurized DSL. There are some other options that you might want to look at. Uh, the first is called Overarch or Overarc. Uh, this gives you the ability to do the same type of thing, uh, rendering with plant GML, and you define your model in this format, which is the extensible data notation EDN, which is not something I've come across much, but that's one option. 
Uh, there's something called RDB modeling, which gives you the ability to generate the same sort of thing, uh, generate a model, create a model as a YAML file. I don't think I can recommend people do that. And where's, where's Bruno when you need him? Um, <laughs> there's something called Pulma, which uh, is a way to create a model on top of plant UML. I don't really understand how this works. Uh, it looks quite complicated, but if you're big into the C4 plant UML ecosystem, uh, that might be something you want to use. And there's something called like C4, which is essentially a clone of the structurized DSL, but it doesn't limit you to the four levels of abstractions. You can add more levels of abstractions and even customize what those abstractions are called. There are trade-offs with doing that. Come talk to me afterwards about those trade-offs. Uh, and the Illograph tool, which I showed you. So again, there are a bunch of options out there. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you found it useful. If you want to get started, structurized.com slash DSL. Thank you.